You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf. And welcome to the Win Win Podcast. This is Ben Wolf, your host. As always, we're going to learn from our guest today when it's time to hire real talent. Moving on, invite everyone to uh, subscribe, leave a review, like, and comment wherever you are seeing this podcast episode or listening to it. And I want to get into introducing at this point our guest today. Uh, our guest is um, has served as an interim or fractional COO uh, or integrator for over five years. Uh, prior to that and uh, continuing through now, he is a longtime COO and operations leader in manufacturing, distribution, healthcare, construction, and other industries. You can learn more about him uh, at wolfsedgeintegrators.com forward slash about. And with that, I give you Matt Haney. Welcome, Matt. Ah, Ben, thanks for having me, Ben. My pleasure. Put out the welcome, Matt, for welcome, Matt. Um, uh, the, you know what's so funny? I probably uh, never heard that before. No, you'll, I, I have this sitting on my desk. It says, hi, I'm Matt. My kids think it's so funny. And Matt on my desk for Matt. So I love that right. you brought that, uh, brought that in there. <laughs> brought that up. Yeah. So for those who can't see, it's a little Matt that says, hi, I'm Matt on it. So That's awesome. The, uh, I appreciate that. So I, I guess let's get us started by, if you give us a quick, like two minute background, quick two minute story to give us a little context, uh, maybe that's not necessarily reflected strictly on paper about your background that, that gets us talking about real talent today. Thanks, Ben. So, first of all, very, very, very glad to be here. I love, uh, I love sitting on podcasts and and uh, sharing stories and having conversations. So, this is going to be a lot of fun. So, quick two minutes about. I've uh, been in Austin, Texas, for twenty years. Um, I, I always tell folks when I'm meeting them, I've never worn a uh, a badge to swipe into a cubicle, or I've never worked for a big corporation. All of my career experience comes from entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially driven companies, big visionary founders that have interests in and growing businesses. And with that, I've gotten to see a lot of different things, some good, some bad. I've been able to have some successes and some failures and have learned from each and every one of them. But, um, you know, I I was fortunate early in my career out of college to be brought into a a high net worth family's uh, individual family office to go acquire single family real estate. And I didn't know anything about single family real estate. I just said, hey, if you'll become an analyst and learn, I'll teach you. He was an entrepreneur that was at Arthur for a while um, and, you know, had, had a big finance back. He spent four years buying single family assets um, across the state of Texas. And we were learning as we were going. Um, and that was a ton of fun. And really working under that entrepreneur gave me my passion for entrepreneurism. Um, and since then, I've worked in, you know, consumer products and construction as an owner, an operator, consultant, um, you know, started and sold a company successfully, immediately turned around and invested some of that in another company and failed and realized that um, I was best in the right seat uh, helping people grow their business. So that's kind of how I landed on where I am today. Awesome. I appreciate it. I mean, so we're talking about real talent and when is it time to bring it on? So first of all, what what, what do you mean when you use the phrase real talents? So it... <laughs> Looking back at, at the people I either served under um, or the people I've hired, there's a there's this feeling of of oh well, I'm not ready to hire that person yet or or oh they're not right or and, and I just think the term real talent means instead of um, wishing you had done something, going and investing in that person and stop and, and not necessarily looking at the big salary overhead that comes associated with that person, rather looking at what that real talent could do for the business. So that's. That's what I mean when I say real talent is people that one um, aspires to have instead of just sitting there wishing that they would have made a decision to hire someone better. Right. Well, so let, let's understand it first also by its opposite. So like when when somebody doesn't have real talent, doesn't have the kind of talent they really need, um, what what does that look like? What does that feel like? What's happening? The best example I have of that, and you've seen this in every business, and I think everyone has seen this, there's somebody in a role that is either put in that role by default, meaning there's no one else to sit in that seat, or by tenure. I think those are the two things. Tenure meaning they've been in the business for quite a while. Um, and, you know, we just, we really need to, we need to put them into that leadership role is the theory. And and I would argue like, well, do you? 
or are you just doing that because there's some fear-based motive that that um, one has created this is well if I if I don't put them in that seat then I'm going to have a bigger issue um, so I think that's the opposite of what real talent is it's a kind of talent by default they're there for one reason not the right reason so what happens? Like, what, what will people be experiencing when they have done that, when they're doing that, when they hire somebody just because they've been there a long time or because they don't want to let them go or because they might leave if you don't give them this promotion to a level of management and leadership? Okay, so you've done it. People have done it. We've all sure, done it. And sure. seen it. So, what you know, paint a picture. What does that look like in the business when people have made those kind of choices? Well, you, you ask what happens. And I think... Um, I think the better way to look at it is what doesn't happen. Like if, okay. if it, it's not like the business is going to implode, or maybe it is, maybe they're not capable of, of the role that's needed to be done. But most times they sort of tick along and there's no real um, exponential anything, right? There's no exponential growth in revenue. There's no exponential growth in, in, um, in, in leadership development. So they just sit there because they're not a natural leader or, or a natural, you know, um, you know, leadership team member. So it's what doesn't happen. And what doesn't happen is you sit there and you say, oh, well, you know, Bill, Bill's, he's been with the company for so long. He's a great guy, but you know, he really isn't, he really isn't great. It's like, well, why are we, why are we saying this to each other? Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't tolerate that in any other scenario. Yet one reason or another, we, we, as people we tend to stick with what we know in the status quo instead of changing it up and making sure that um, we're constantly you know, bettering ourselves and moving forward. So, so to answer it simply, it's not, it, it's just what you're missing. It's the opportunity cost of having that person in the seat mm -hmm. that frankly doesn't need to be there. All right. So lack of exponential growth, lack of forward momentum, more just ticking along. That's most often what's going to happen. Are there times when it's appropriate uh, to, to make those kind of decisions for quote unquote, not real talent? Or, you know, because someone's been been there longer or like, are there instances where uh, where that where that is appropriate? Is that ever appropriate? Yeah, no, I, I do. I, I use. Um, I ask I ask a lot of people um, if this person doesn't show up tomorrow, what breaks? And that's the that's the question I ask myself and I ask everyone around me is to is what breaks? Like, really? No, if, if they week, what happens? And and I promise you, eight out of ten times, people say, "Well, nothing," but you know, blah blah blah. It's like, well, wait, visionary, so that uh, you have this person right there, and it's their for or their their company notice they're gone. So um, I think that's one thing. But your question was, are there instances where it's okay to tolerate that? Is that your question? tolerate the insufficiency yeah, of, I mean, of, of the earlier stages in a business yeah. or well there's two, two examples one i would say is is um if you as the visionary or business owner have entrusted this person and a lot of times that's the case with um all of the knowledge in the business for example they know everything about the business um ins and outs they know vendor relationships they know the logins to the internet whatever it is um, and you haven't, or one hasn't decided to get that information out of their head and into another format where you can actually get control, then it may make sense to leave them in there for a minute. But but the other side of that is you've also got to work to make sure that they're not holding you hostage to your own business and holding that knowledge. Um, you know, and then and then the other scenario with that. So the second one to that is, you know, if if that person is not necessarily impeding growth, but investing in a different person, whatever department, individual, is going to give you more immediate and better long-term results than leaving that person who is not a quote-unquote real talent in place because they're not a detriment to the business and focusing on where you might get more exponential results by investing in another um, you know, real talent at a different department. So you're kind of trading off and saying, I'm going to Take the um, inadequacies here, inadequacies here, and then I'm going to turn around and invest. So if you only had one to choose from, which one's right. better for the business in the short right. term and the long term? Right. So, you know, it's a complicated scenario, and working with individuals and, and leaders is complicated. But the, the biggest theme is just to not put yourself in a position to, to continually tolerate, you know, mediocrity. Right. 
Well, one of the, I want to go back to one of the things you said earlier, which was about how sometimes you just got to like bite the bullet and, you know, and, and yeah. invest in the, in the higher priced person who actually can do, has done before the things right. that your business needs and that you need and you want. So, you know, but that, that is such a high price. And like, you know, yeah. that really is the hard part, right? Because you don't, you know, you're worried, will it work out? What if we make the wrong decision and whoever we hire, and then there's all this organizational trauma and cultural damage and personal damage and PTSD that I, as the business owner, I'm going to get uh, from having made that mistake uh, or the damage that's going to be caused uh, or just uh, like that, that's, that's a, that's just a, a high fixed cost. It's added to overhead GNA. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a big investment and may not, you know, we may not have the cash flow to necessarily justify it immediately. What do you, what do you tell, what, 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 what do you tell a business owner who's like really like, well, yeah, I'd love to do that, but I don't know that I can, or I don't know that I responsibly can. Like what, what, what right. do you say to that person? So the first thing I'm going to say is look at your bank balance. It sounds simple, but it's something that, that I always tell folks, like you look at your bank, you, you're make are you make if you don't have good financials and know your profitability, just judge your bank balance the very simplest way. And, and and understand where your comfort level is in terms of how much cash reserves you need to have in the business to operate it, regardless of talent, almost regardless of talent. But a lot of times we we convince ourselves that we can't afford it. Um, and sometimes you legitimately can't. If the model's broken and the business isn't making money, then you're right. Spending more money on talent is just throwing good money at bad. So the first thing is, is um, and, and this is where us operationally minded humans don't necessarily get the most immediate return on investment. But if you were to invest in real operational talent, as an example, or real finance talent or real sales talent, that person, he or she, would go in and do a you know, cost-benefit analysis on themselves, essentially. Like, hey, what are you planning to bring to the business um, that's going to you know, generate more revenue or save expense? So um, simply said, um, you should look at these these real talent investments as an opportunity to become more profitable, gain more revenue. And measuring that, having a tangible that says, you know, if this person works out after three months, they will have paid for themselves. After four months, after six months, well, then you just have to look at the delta between what you're paying the current person to do a mediocre job right. and paying real talent to do the job that you want. And what I think people will realize is that a lot of times you just think, oh, it's a $150,000 salary. It's like, well, yeah, well, you're paying somebody $85,000. So really the Delta $65,000 spread out over however many months it takes that person to pay for themselves, if you will. And then you see that light go on a lot of times in people's eyes and they go, wow, I never thought of it that way. I just kept seeing this big number ahead of me and realizing that and thinking that that was too overwhelming. So just breaking down that big ask or that big investment into manageable chunks looking at your cash flow currently, and then being a little bit speculative around what it would be once this person has become in the seat mm -hmm. efficient. Right. Um, wh what are some of the other things that I guess, what are some of the other head trash or other things that people listening to or watching this might be saying to themselves that might be getting in the way of them think of them being, ready to pull the trigger and really start investing in themselves and their business and make real change with people and the less comfortable, you know, sure. uh, status quo that they might be in. What, what are some of the other things people might be saying to themselves? Well, I, I'll go back a little bit because I, I do think it's important. I'm a big fan of peer mentorship and, and uh, having a group of people that are trusted advisors that are, you know, don't necessarily have a, a, a financial interest in your business. So a board member could be an idea or just a trusted entrepreneur that you know, I would ask them um, their opinion. A lot of times it's easy for one to just kind of stay focused in their business and not look outside. But I've found personally and through working with my clients that having an outside opinion that does not have a financial stake in your business, looking, hearing, and, and talking back with you around um, how the business is operating. And you want to tell this person to just to, to give an honest opinion, have a conversation, tell them what you're struggling with, and then um, re revisit it in a couple of days and talk about that with that person. Hey, what did you think? You know, I told you everything. What's your suggestion? 
And if nothing, it's another person's perspective that doesn't stare at the business every day. If you don't have right. a consultant or you don't have an advisor, go find somebody. Everybody loves to share and help and, and um, hopefully they'll have gray hair and have, uh, have, have won a time or two and lost a time or two. So first I would say to that, that's, that's the biggest thing. Don't, don't operate in your own head because mm. you've been in a business for five years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it's, there is head trash. There's pre-existing conditions. Um, but uh, I, I think that's, it's a sidebar to your, your original question. Um, but it is relevant because your point is head trash is that we, we convince ourselves one thing when in fact, someone's out, outside perspective may disprove that totally. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and also give yourself a break, like give yourself some, some grace in doing what you're doing. It's hard to be an owner, operator, a visionary all the time and, and be expected to, to dance and perform the way, the way that the world holds of you. Um, so, I mean, that's all along the lines of head trash, but there's always a way to justify mediocrity. It's just who we are making change is hard. And, um, there's a lot of times where, um, it's just easier to status quo. It's just easier. So, um, but I do have an example I wanted to, to bring up, and it's yeah. around hiring real talent in the HR department. Mm -hmm. um, HR tends to be one of those things that I think, um, in small businesses anyway, is is an afterthought at times because um, you know it's, it doesn't affect the business. That's the that's the theory. But in reality, it's, it affects every single piece of the business. So investing in a, an outside HR firm early um, or fractional HR leader or someone that can can objectively, uh, unobjectively look at your business and say, hey, these are some things um, we need to work on. And I'll give you a quick example. Onboarding. Onboarding is the first example, to, or the first experience you get to have with that person outside of the interview process. And if your onboarding process includes here's your email address and login and your laptop. Um, go watch Bill. He knows what he's doing. That, that's not an onboarding process. That is a typical, right? Just Isn't like it? How many times out? have you done that? Here's yeah. your internet password and here's your issued laptop. Go down the road. Yeah. Um, but that's the first impression. So an HR, fractional HR person would say, we need to develop this onboarding process. We need to have a handbook. These things seem... Um, inconsequential, but they're actually, in the grand scheme of things, it protects you in so many ways for labor issues. Um, and, and it's like, wow, I'm going into a professional onboarding process. So investing in real talent in HR will pay dividends. But if you're not cash flow positive, and, and that is something that um, you're concerned about, then, then investing in real HR talent immediately may not be the best course. But I have seen many small business owners um, you know, reluctantly take in fractional HR only to realize this is really incredible. I don't have to do all these things I did before. Mm -hmm. And now I have somebody that's trained in HR practices and I don't have to be the, the thought leader in that. So it's a small example of something that um, I think is easy to overlook, uh, but could make a big impact in the business. No, it's a great example. Any other things come to mind, stories or examples? You know, I um, um, yeah, there's this is a big thing to me. Um, investing in real talent means you've got to hire in, in, in a perfect scenario. You would be hiring real talent to uh, observe and shadow over someone who is eventually going to be replaced by that person. And there's been several instances in my career, businesses I've owned or clients I've worked with where they say, well, how do I get Bill out when he holds so much information? And it's going to be really awkward for me and Bill if I'm constantly pulling out this information from him in order to make the transition. Right. That's a great for question. the new person, right? Great question. So everybody has their ways on how they do that. Um, but the best part about it is it forces the entrepreneur to be intentional about getting information with that person. And, and, and maybe he or she um, hasn't spent enough time with this person because they're tenured. Well, now all of a sudden, when you're when you're planning a transition out, the entrepreneur is the visionary is involved with that person who's leaving, and you you start to realize what they've been hiding or protecting or or keeping from you, or their you know their inability to grow 
um, with the business as it's needed. And I've seen on a couple of occasions, the visionary says, man, I didn't really realize how incapable this person was until I started working on their transition out. Mm-hmm. Well, then they're buying into the, they're buying into their own fear and, mm-hmm. and, and moving it forward. So, um, moving forward to get committing that person out of the business actually gives people reassurance that they're not the right person in the right seat. So then you're mm-hmm. like, okay, great. I've spent two weeks with them learning what they do. And if they didn't show up tomorrow, I, the visionary, the owner could do their work because I've spent two weeks with them learning. But then you've got an immediate assurance of the fact that if there is a gap, right, that's one seat empties or waiting to fill it, that you can still operate your business because you know what they do. You know where the, you know, the skeletons are buried. You know where the logins to the, to the uh, passwords are and it becomes less scary. Um, right. so that transition period is, is always something that comes up. Like what happens if we tell them and they leave today? Well, we got to be ready for that. We've got to be ready that they may walk out the door and never show back up again. Um, so being intentional around the transition of, of old versus new is, um, all- alleviates a lot of concern. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. It also reminds me of one of our colleagues that, uh, you, you might've heard the story with as well from the last week or two where they, they, there are greater levels of accountability. One of our Wolf's Edge integrators yeah. colleagues, one of their greater levels of accountability with one of their clients uh, where, you know, she was a fractional COO, you know, ended up ultimately leading two people who they knew were these, you know, no longer real talent type people, whatever, yeah. people, you know, who were holding things back. And there was a head of AR who, you know, kind of kept this little fiefdom, you know, yeah. with all this, yeah. you know, nobody else knew exactly what she was doing. And then when, she and then she left because they were, you know, introducing more accountability and more sure. metrics, and they really and then they realized this wasn't going to go away. Like they were, it was. Oh wow, uh, this is really going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. you really mean it's not just a this fad. This is real. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. So then she left, and then they discovered, oh my gosh, you know, like all this AR that was not collected. Now there's all this money they can actually go after now because right. she was not on top of it. That's um, right. But these skeletons, as you talk about it, that were actually uncovered because one of these, you know, seemingly key people uh, left and they had to figure out what to do. So they're going through a hard tra- transition now, but on the other side of it is hiring real talent actually in this, right. in this, in this AR role and in one other one, I don't remember in, the, in this particular business, but. Yeah, no, it's that's that. the real thing. Like I said, the minute you intentionally focus on replacing that role, you start to see a lot of things. Um, and I think more times than not, you be more one becomes more comfortable with the transition because they see the inadequacies. And it's not any fault of of the visionary or the owner of the business. It's more like you know, there's priorities all over the place, right? We've got a hundred different priorities, and 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 replacing somebody that's mediocre doesn't rise to the top of the list when you're in yeah. fight or flight mode. It's just not priority. Yeah. But one of the things I wanted to talk about was promoting within um, and up, up promoting talent from a, you know, a manager level to a director level or director to executive level, it's particularly with somebody that's been in the business for a long time. And if, if you've got that person that's been in their role for a long time and they're good, but they're not great, perhaps for the business long-term, but they haven't really done anything to justify being fired. They're kind of in that, that neutral position. Mm-hmm. Um, You've got two choices. You can either have, because there, there's a good chance that they're frustrated, right? Or they're looking, if you will, because, you know, people need to be stimulated and engaged and rewarded and measured. And we all like that level of of uh, accountability, whether or not we like the word. We do like being told we're doing a good job. Um, so I always tell people you can invest in leadership training for that person and see how they adapt to that training. And that doesn't mean you've got to go spend $50,000 on a leadership training course. It means you could go on an online program that's over, you know, six or eight weeks and you as the owner of the business can do that leadership training with them because Mm -hmm. you've either got to promote them out of the business from, I'm sorry, promote them into the next role or maybe free up their salary to go invest in real talent. So because the owner hasn't invested in that leadership talent before, they don't know what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. So investing in a course, getting somebody that can help you train them into becoming a leader and then see how they do. And if they don't cut it for one reason or another, you're going to know it and they're going to know it too. Mm -hmm. So that might make you understand 
their capabilities, good or bad, also spur the conversation of what are we doing here, right? Um, so investing in leadership training is is important um, if you want to promote somebody. Otherwise, you're just going to dump them into a seat and wish them well. Right. Yeah, one hundred percent. It makes sense. It actually, that actually happened with uh, I got a lead as a somebody looking for integrator or COO coaching. Uh, somebody needed to level up. You know, they're a great mm-hmm. operator, a ton of knowledge, and wasn't you know wanted to see them, but not fully you know being that COO that they needed mm-hmm. to be. Just you know being being a little more narrowly focused than they than they should right. be on the whole business. And so I I recommended a leadership training and emotional intelligence coach to them that they that they retained that they used. Yeah. Uh, he, he reported to me a few days ago that the that this integrator COO uh, that that he felt like they got a value from it, that he heard reports from other people in the business, that they saw a difference in how that person was operating, you know, that it was positive. And so that definitely could be a good ROI on that, on that leadership training. So yeah. no, it's, it's, and if nothing else, it, it puts intentionality behind, and, and I recommend the owner does it with them or the visionary does it with them because okay. you need it. As the owner of the visionary, there's there's no there's no shortage of need for continuing education or or um, you know HR related practices and policies and how to deal with people. So we can all benefit from training. Period. Um, so it's not a waste of anyone's time, and it's going to allow you as the business owner to dedicate that focus on making sure this person is a capable leader. Um, so I, I to your point, like people see it, people notice, people are appreciative, and. I don't know how that backfires. I don't. I don't know what the downside is of putting someone through a leadership program, other than I guess the cost. But some of them are so reasonably, you know, priced that mm-hmm. kind of hard not to. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing I thought of um, assessments and, and hiring. This kind of goes back to finding that real talent and making sure. You mentioned something earlier that str- that struck a nerve with me, which is. You know, hiring slow and firing fast, essentially, which is making sure that 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 person you're hiring, this real talent, um, is the right person for your culture. Uh, I'm a fan of Culture Index. I think uh, it does great things. I know there's a million Briggs out there. I think, Ben, you've probably got a three or four that you've used. But for me, making sure the culture is the right fit, because on paper, they've got a great resume, right? They've done all mm-hmm. these good things. They also come with a big salary. But what if they're going to come in and disrupt everything you've built? Well, you can't risk that. That's not, that's a non-starter. So hiring, spending time doing assessments, getting real, real, real references and referrals. I always tell people like, don't give me the three people that are going to say everything great about you. Because if I ask and call your reference and they tell you you're great, 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 well then what are, are we're really not doing ourselves a favor here. I want to know where you struggle too. And I'll be the first one to tell you where mine is and where I struggle as an owner or a visionary. So spending time on cultural assessments, understanding and asking hard questions about where they're short so that you're making sure, A, I'm spending all this money, B, I'm a cultural risk potentially to these to this business, and C, I don't want to look like a fool for hiring the wrong person. So spend the time up front, get references, do some sort of culture assessment or disc profile or Myers-Briggs. To, to let you in under the hood on how that real talent operates um, on a day-to-day. Awesome. Matt, really appreciate this conversation today, everything that you shared. Uh, it's a great topic. It comes up, you know, in every business that wants to grow at least. Right. Uh, so really, really appreciate this. Thank you for the time today. It was awesome. Always good to chat with you, sir. And um, look forward to doing it again. You too. Looking forward. And everybody else, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you. You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf.